Hello and welcome to the book club. This is the series of videos where we read a book together and then talk about it both here on the channel and in our Goodreads. There's a link in the description to that. I'm joined this time by my housemate Dan, Hello. who is a classics and English student, so he actually is used to talking about books. And this uh, time around we're talking about The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. What's it about? Well, a um, bit of an absurdist piece this time, quite different to the one that you've done last uh, last episode, I think. But basically, our main character, Gregor Samsa, awakes one morning to find himself transformed into a monstrous cockroach, and a series of events entail. Uh, and basically, his life kind of crumbles around around him, really. I mean, it's, and the other thing to point out is it is a short story. It is. It's not a full novel. It's like a hundred and twenty odd pages, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and it's very different from what we've read before. So for one thing, this is fiction, and it is a very bizarre piece of fiction. Um, you read this as part of your IB? I did, yeah. So in my first year, so that would have been year 11, it was one of our set texts. In fact, uh, I lent, this is my copy um, that I lent Simon, it's got... Uh, Danny. <laughs> Danny and C3, my class, and I think some notes throughout the book, which is quite funny. It was kind of useful to me to see which bits you'd underlined. Yeah, actually. yeah. Key points. Um, so I suppose we can start by saying 1913... Yeah, was when this was early in his career. Yeah, um, so I guess why don't we? How did you? How different did you find this from reading other non-fiction, especially given it's shorter as well? Yeah, um, I only read it in like three set sittings, I think. Um, whereas something like *Sapiens*, it was a long process. Um, and one of the things about it is it does feel very stream of consciousness. Um, I know it wasn't written in one night, unlike at least one of his other stories, but it did kind of have that feeling that he was just writing whatever came into his head, and I feel like that suited the way that I read it. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, just reading fiction, because this is different from a lot of fiction I've read before, because it's absurdist, and it is quite... If you actually picture what's going on, quite gross. Mm. Um, it definitely made me feel things. Uh, most surprisingly, it made me very sympathetic towards a giant cockroach. Yeah. I empathised with the character of Gregor an awful lot. Yeah, yeah. Am I weird for that? I don't think so, no. I think that's kind of the point. I mean, it's worth mentioning that um, while it's an absurdist piece, um, the the phrase Kafka esque is thrown around, around quite a bit, and that kind of is part and parcel um, of defining absurdist writing. Except the slight difference, I suppose, you could make with Kafka is that this a this usually and kind of an insecty, verminy undertone. Um, that first phrase actually um, transformed into a monstrous cockroach um, is an interesting one because. Uh, the text itself was originally written in German, mm. so uh, it's really interesting not only for, to look at the book from a plot and kind of um, story perspective, but also consider some of the kind of sociocultural um, considerations, which, which you don't always get to do with um, fiction, but you do get to with translated text. So, for instance, the original German word they use directly translates as vermin. Um, now, you can kind of see the link there between them saying, right, cockroach. Um, interestingly, though, uh, the German sense of the word vermin actually means something more like rats. Yeah, I don't think it ever really specifies. I mean, it goes into details about like his uh, numerous legs and he yeah. emits certain substances. Uh, when he's injured, there's like a, a scab, but there's like an ichor yeah. kind of thing. There is a kind of... Uh, some, uh, there are an allusions to he's almost got kind of a, um, a carapace body. A yeah, kind of it, it's implied that he's insect, like an insect, yeah. rather than a rat. Yeah. But, um, as you say, it's, it's a sort of a cultural thing, I guess, that in yeah. German, the vermin probably has different connotations. Yeah, which, for an isolated instance like that, considering the um, translated uh, choices that has have and have to be made, um, it's also interesting to kind of think about how much the book then reflects kind of a German attitude to not only kind of um, life at the time, but how kind of German is the story, um, and how many of those cultural considerations do you then have to think about while reading the text, especially approaches to humour. There are moments where um, the the reason that you feel slightly alienated, um, which is a massive theme within the text, mm. um, is that there are times where there's this kind of weird, quite twisted sense of humour um, that's going on along with this really quite crushingly sad story. Well, he, he completely mis misunderstands people's intentions towards him. Yeah. I mean, the first thing that he does is he wakes up and thinks, I'm an insect. Oh, I've got to go to work. I'm late for work. I've got to go. Um, which 
it's clear, which is obviously you know it tells something very important about the character. Yeah. Because I don't think a huge number of people would wake up and think that mm. if they were, you know, and I th- I'm sure part of that is the character, but also part of it is the culture. Um, he was well. It's, is it in Prussia technically? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So you know, it, it, say, say it's in the Prussian Empire. Yeah. Um, you know, as a young man, we do lo- later learn that he's basically just providing for his family. Yeah. Um, you know, there's this real work ethic that he had to be at work at like seven o'clock mm. and wouldn't get back until very late. The sole breadwinner for the family. Mm. Um, yeah, and taking off from that, um, the sense as we talked about earlier about about that kind of alienation and him being the sole breadwinner for the family, and. Upon first reading the text, you you kind of think, right, well, his life is going downhill because of this transformation. Um, As you were just saying a minute ago, um, he wakes up and the first thing he does is, within kind of pages of him waking up, realising he's been transformed. Um, His boss is knocking on his door, asking Mm. why he's not at work. His work hasn't been up to scratch. Um, One of the things that you kind of can take from a first reading is that how um, his mental state affects his kind of physical world around him and himself so to say that if he's you know he things are going poorly for him after this transformation um and that that kind of affects his relationships in the house and but certainly his sister's quite an interesting yeah and and the environment of his room Mm. yeah as he gets more um insect like and more monstrous he he, well he loses his humanity and so the room becomes dustier and dustier and he starts walking on the ceiling and things like that yeah um i think the point about his sister is an interesting one because Thinking about it now, there's almost two parallel lines of development um, in terms of not sexuality, but I guess almost like empowerment yeah. um, with his sister on one hand, who goes from being um, almost like a girly girl, I guess you could say, yeah. um, to being recognised at the very end by her parents as this strong, independent woman who actually apparently does need a man. Um, and then at the same time, the father, who when you first meet him is sort of you know drowsy and asleep and things like that and very old and decrepit. But I think it's the I think it's when he comes out of the room. It's the end of part two, I want to say, mm-hmm. when the the father comes back and he's all bedecked in like this new uniform and he's glorious. Oh, yeah. so it's a very striking image of like yeah. him striding back into the house. Mm. Um, it's also interesting to look at those family figures around him as. Uh, at the very beginning of the video, you said that you you had a kind of quite an overwhelming sense of sympathy mm. for him, looking at each character and looking at them as kind of various levels of sympathy. So the most um, strikingly unsympathetic, I suppose you could say, is um, his father. Yeah. Um, however, at no point, um, despite the fact knowing that as you read through the book um, or the story, I should say, um, the the family come to realize that Gregor needs to go because they're you know he's dragging them down and they're you know they're reaching a more kind of poverty stricken state. Um, but at no point does the father ever suggest you know killing him for one. Is that, it's the sister him. that says it. I think, yeah, yeah, it? yeah. Um, and for the father who is the most um, kind of hurtful, I suppose he never reaches that level. Each member of the family represents mm. sympathy to a degree. Um, he sort of stops seeing the humanity straight away. Yeah, you know he's shooing him like a like vermin back into the room. Whereas his sister sees him still as his uh, brother, and the mother kind of never really loses it. No. Still always sees him as her son. Which is also interesting to, uh, from a characterization point. How much of a role does the mother really play? Um, yeah. The the think the one thing that sets it apart is that the uh, sister, um, it plays a certainly a larger role, but the mother is still very much this kind of old view figure. Um, she she isn't particularly characterised. Um, she's a she's much more in the background than the striking father and um, the sister with the, uh, certainly the violin scenes as well. Yeah, well, I mean, I was about to say that the the, the other uh, entry into that is the lodgers. So mm. these three gentlemen who uh, arrive at the house and they take in to make money, and I'm sure that it's obviously not a story that's just about what it's written about. Mm. There's a lot of allegory in this. Yeah. What do you think they are for? Why are they in the story? Certainly not taking them at face value. As you say, um, this kind of uh, Prussian old world kind of society is being established. Um, I I would certainly say that you could possibly make a kind of socio-political reading into those characters based on the, um, the one kind of main speaker for the group. Certainly that isn't particularly hard to take a political reading from. Um, their kind of reactions towards Gregor um, 
But it's like their society as, as large, yeah, really. Disgust. I mean, do you think that, that Kafka identified with Gregor? Like, what, what did he put those men into is how he was perceived by the rest of society? Because I think he was in a relatively similar position to Gregor in terms of, yeah, sort it's of economically. Very, it's very, very similar. Also, the, the, the kind of... It's interesting earlier how you, you mentioned the kind of not necessarily sexual, but kind of gender empowerment perspective. Mm. Uh, Kafka as an individual... Gosh, this is, I'm, if I'm remembering back to year eleven, I remember he, he was a very, very um, tormented individual, um, mm. both as, as sexually. For one, he was he was a really quite bizarre guy, um, but I I would certainly think that, as you say, those three individuals representative of how he thought society saw him. Um, and so it's so it's kind of self reflective in a way. Yeah, as a book, which is quite sad. Yeah. Um, I mean, to be fair, I think part of the reason I empathise with, with Gregor so much is that the reaction of, I've woken up and I've been turned into an insect. Um, basically, nobody would ever think, I need to go to work. But if, you'd, if that had happened to me when I was, say, in my fourth year at Oxford, um, without question, that would be the first thing I would have thought. Mm. Like, I think, I think it was indicative, and it was the same thing, it was people misreading people's intentions. Um, and so su- to suggest, oh, we should get the doctor, and him thinking, oh, no, no one can see me like this, was, I, you know, I can definitely understand where he was coming from. And it's those, it's those moments where, um, where kind of logic is subverted that really make it a kind of... That's Kafkaesque. Really, yeah, yeah. Ka- yeah, and that absurdist um, kind of vibe. And on a kind of absurdist note... Um, it's worth, I think, drawing a comparison. If we're looking at, uh, as we were talking about, the kind of socio-cultural um, aspects, um, Bertold Brecht, epic theatre. Mm. Um, he, what well, one of the kind of ide- identifying features of epic theatre was this notion of the alienation effect, or the. Here we go. Come on, year eleven. <laughs> The Freidung's effect, I think it's called, which is basically this aspect in epic theatre where um, an audience would be made, it would be made incredibly obvious to them that they are watching a piece of theatre. So things like breaking the fourth wall, also oddly comic moments in very kind of serious um, parts in the plot. Hmm. So moments that we have in here where you do think kind of, oh, well, that is just so, that is that is bizarre, that is absurd. Um Makes those, you very aware you're reading a book. Yeah, and, and it was those those writings that then informed Brecht. He had a, a, a oh, right. had a profound influence on him, um, and both obviously German. So. Because I mean, the, the the other interesting thing about it that I noticed was the the prose. If I was to describe what the prose is like, it's like a bare room. Mm. Like it is very crisp, yeah. um, and it's kind of unflinching. Which which, given the subject matter, makes 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 it even more horrifying. Yeah, you know. But at the same time, so it's drawing you in and drawing you in and saying, you know, look at this without blinking. Look at how horrifying this transformation is. But at the same time, you're reading a book. Yeah. But you and know, it's that it's that drawing you in yeah. and making you you're constantly aware that you are reading a piece of writing. He's he's drawing you in, but only not so that you get so involved that you forget that it's you've always got this kind of meta relationship with the book in that you always know you're reading it. It doesn't suck you in like a I don't know um, a Game of Thrones or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Something where the where the text is so. Um, Flowery is the wrong word, but there's such emphasis on kind of description and you know metaphor, simile, all of these devices to really pull you in and make you feel part of the world rather than as an, as like an observer. Mm. And that whole observer vibe of the kind of if you look at how space is used in the book, interiors and exteriors, oh, you very yeah, much yeah. never hear about the outside world. It's a very claustrophobic effect. Yeah, yeah. which is which is how uh, you know um, Gregor's early life when he's reflecting on. Uh, before he's woken up and he's realised he's changed, you you start to hear that he's not happy with his life. You know, he feels um, unappreciated from his family. He's a sole breadwinner, but they've just taken it for granted. Um, he doesn't like his... He's a kind of door-to-door salesman, isn't he? A travelling salesman, yeah. yeah. Um, and that kind of being up and about and moving everywhere means that he kind of... The relationships he has in his life aren't really very meaningful. So he's already unhappy there. So you could say that um, while the transformation the physical transformation um affects his life his life has already been affected um psychologically so you've got this weird kind of does the mind inform the body or the body inform the mind does his transformation cause him unhappiness or is it that original unhappiness Mm. that causes the transformation sort of eroding the 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 mind body duality yeah very much like a 
metamorphosis. It's not just one change, it's a series of stages. You are good. This is why I bring him on the channel. <laughs> why should people read it then? Um, I think people should read it because it is a classic literary text. Um, it's a fine, fine example of um, absurdist writings. Um, and it's, it's, it's very different to, I think, anything else that you will read. Um, it's a challenging read. It is. Times, yeah. yeah, it's definitely not something that you you settle in in front of a fire on like a cozy evening. Yeah, and think, oh, I'm just going to crack open the metamorphosis. Yeah, it's not a feel good read. Um, it's not a happy go lucky, you know. But in the same way that you might watch a film, um, something like Son of Saul, maybe, mm. um, you know, or yeah. Schindler's List, you don't watch it because you're anticipating you're going to enjoy it. You're watching it because it's a challenging piece mm. and there's lots to interpret from it. Yeah, and it's those it's those many interpretations, both literary and kind of meta literary. Um, i.e. what's happening within the plot and what has informed the writing of the book, like those sociocultural factors we spoke about, mm. um, that makes it really interesting too. Not only is it absurdist, but if you just purely look at it from a work in translation and how they translated it, um, I think it's a pretty interesting one. So we're only one part of the book club. We want to hear what you guys thought about The Metamorphosis, if you read it. So put them down in the comments and also comment on what you thought of I mean, it's not really our; it's really your interpretation. <laughs> I'm here as a passenger, really. It's a great, it's a, it's a great combination of, of kind of views, though, because I very much like the more fictitious works, whereas you're far more kind of um, well read in uh, in non-fiction. So. Yeah, maybe I approach it more from a structure and yeah. prose perspective. I find because I did a lot of. I mean, did you ever do much writing? Uh, as in like creative writing yes okay yeah. so we're probably both approaching it from the language perspective yeah, as well yeah, yeah. Then. sorry I, I was a mean English student did, did, I, did I do much creative writing yes I, think I don't I, know a little you, bit you might to... have just been interested in non-fiction as this well this is true yeah but um, the next book we're going to be reading I just happen to have a copy oh, here is as popularly requested on our uh, Goodreads group, A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. So this is very much my domain. Yeah, related yeah. To yours. I tried to read this when I was about 10, um, and I remember I got laughed at in the primary school uh, playground. Uh, probably for good reason. But um, we're both going to try and read this. Yes, um, yes. I think it's probably going to be about a month, uh, because we've both got a lot on and you've got enough to read as it is. Yeah. But if you'd like to take part in the next book club, then get yourself a copy either from a local bookshop or from your local library, and try and read along. Uh, it's not actually that long. It's less than 200 pages, and it has fantastic diagrams like that. And it's a classic of uh, sort of science communication. Um, so I would highly encourage you to get a copy. Um, if you don't know what it's about, by the way, it's sort of about modern physics, really. I mean, the subtitle is from big, the Big Bang to Black Holes, so a lot of large-scale physics stuff. But I think there's also small-scale in here. And it's also vaguely current because of the success with um, The Theory of Everything. Obviously, that with Eddie Redmayne, um, that book features yes. quite greatly in his so story. I, I thought you meant that there had been like a Theory of Everything discovered. Oh, like, no. Whoa! I... <laughs> You've missed out something massive. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, that's the, one of the reasons I want to read it, actually. So thank you for joining us for this video, talking about the metamorphosis, and we hope to see you next time, both of us, Yeah, yeah. Uh, for uh, A Brief History of Time. If you did enjoy the video, give it a like and subscribe if you want to see more book videos. Bye. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>